Before attempting to through hike the Uinta Highline Trail, you're gonna wanna listen to what I have to say. I'm Tayson, and in this video, we're gonna talk about the most important things that you need to pay attention to before you start out on this hike. Last summer, five of us started on this trip and only four of us were able to complete it. And the year before that, none of us were able to finish the trail. So we've learned a lot of valuable things from this trail, and we wanna share those with you right now. Even if you're not thinking about doing this exact hike anytime soon, there is a lot of great overlap with other high elevation, high exertion hikes. So if you're interested in the Colorado Trail or the John Muir, listen up, take some notes. Your trip and your life may depend on it. Let's start by setting the right expectations. The Uinta Highline Trail is 108 miles of rugged wilderness country where you'll be climbing over 16,000 feet vertically along the route. Not only that, but it goes high and it stays high with over 80% of the trail being over 10,000 feet in elevation. Most people take seven to eight days to complete this trail and while we've hiked it east to west and west to east, our recommendation is to hike from the east side so that you can finish on a high above tree line, getting some of the most beautiful vistas this country has to offer. All right, so let's talk about trail conditions. This trail is rocky. I mean, think about walking down a dry riverbed with sharp rocks rather than nice round cobblestones. That's what a lot of this trail ends up feeling like, especially by the time you're getting to the end. So plan on that. I'm gonna cover some gear requirements here in just a minute where I will also cover foot protection, but just know this trail is quite rocky. As far as water goes on this trail, there is a ton of water every five to eight miles, except for in one section on the east side. From about mile uh, 7 to mile 27, there's a 20 mile dry section. This can be quite challenging for people as you either need to be able to blitz through that in one shot and be able to carry enough water or camp in that dry section, uh, which usually means you've got to be able to load up on water. Not only is it dry, but it's also lower, so be wary of that. However, uh, the rest of the trail, there's going to be abundant water and you won't have to do much for water carry. There's also a section on this trail between Dead Man Pass and Rocky Sea Pass where there is a burn. Um, we were able to go right through the burn without rerouting, so that saved us a lot of time. And I think you should be able to do the same as long as you have the route planned out um, on your phone or some kind of a mapping device. Weather on a high elevation trip like this can vary drastically. Uh, typically think of three season conditions, even if you're going in the heart of summer. You can have massive storms roll in and greatly disrupt your plans, which we had happen in this video, which we'll link right up here. Or you can have just a ton of sun and wind exposure. It's really just a, a variety of conditions that can happen to you at any point in time. So prepare for that. It's also wise for you to plan ahead of time, both in terms of food and time, um, that if you can maybe have a day of padding, in case you do have a disruptive storm come in, you can wait that out and continue on your trail versus um, cancel the entire trip completely. All right, let's talk about physical requirements for this trail. This trail is very demanding and I strongly recommend that you train ahead of time. Log miles, walk on uneven ground, make sure that you're um, increasing both in your leg strength and your ankle strength to make sure that you don't roll your ankle in the middle of the wilderness and get into a situation that would be less than pleasant. Um, so make sure that you're training ahead of time. Another aspect of showing up ready for this trail is going to be pertaining to avoiding high altitude sickness. Now, this is common and, and I've seen it happen time and time again, even within our own group, as well as watching other videos of this trail. It is very, very unforgiving when it comes to that. So what can you do for this? Come into this trail well rested with low amounts of stress on the body. And then make sure that you stay very well hydrated. This is the number one thing I see people do wrong at altitude is they get up there, there's a ton of sun exposure, there's a ton of wind, and they are sweating and getting dehydrated and they don't know it. And if you get dehydrated, it makes your heart work harder, it makes everything, uh, it makes just more stress on the body, which puts you at risk for high altitude sickness. 
So make sure you stay hydrated and show up to that trail well rested. Personally, I love to use my Garmin watch to track my vitals on a trail like this. I'll watch my heart rate specifically and my resting heart rate. When I go to bed, if I was to go to bed and see my resting heart rate, which is usually about a 44, if it was anywhere near an 80, I know that I'm doing something wrong and I need to get more hydrated or I need to figure out how to re reduce the amount of stress on my body because I'm putting myself at risk for high altitude sickness. Now, those are things that I've built over a long period of time going into elevation, but if you start to track your vitals, it can be become a very important tool for you to avoid getting sick at altitude. One of the questions that we get quite often is about high altitude medications. Now we haven't had the best luck with those, but I would still advise you to go and consult with your own doctor and follow what they tell you closely. Um, showing up and just taking those for the first time on trail can put you at risk of just derailing your trip. So be wary of that. Make sure you're bringing electrolytes. You are going to be drinking a lot because of that exposure and electrolytes will help you retain uh, some of that hydration. And last, make sure that you're bringing food that you like. Trail test your food. There's no towns in the middle of this hike where you could resupply. There's no options for anything like that. So the food that you bring on day one is the food you're gonna have to eat on day five. So make sure you like it. All right, we're a gear company. So obviously we've got to talk about gear requirements for this trail. The most important thing that I want to stress is stay as light as possible. Yeah, on mile one, you might be happy that you've got a 20 or 25 pound base weight pack, but by the time you get to mile 105, you're going to wish that your pack was a fraction of that weight. Every pound will matter the farther you get onto this trail in these demanding conditions. So try to cut as much weight out of your pack as you can. The gold standard, in my opinion, is between 10 and 12 pounds for the base weight before food and water. Um, that should allow you to stay very light, but also bring the ad adequate protection that you'll need for a trail like this. And I say adequate protection because you will need to bring things like rain protection. Um, the weather can change so fast up there that you could get rained on and get hypothermic in no time. So those are the kind of conditions you're up against. So bring rain protection, bring puffies, bring a shelter that can handle a storm, or in our case, even needed to handle some snow load in August. Make sure that you're looking at gear that can handle three season conditions, and we do highly stress utilizing a proper layering system. Now, if you don't know the ins and out of a layering system, we'll put a link down below in the description where you can go and read about what a layering system is and how you can use that to stay both light and comfortable on a trail like this. All right, let's talk about foot protection. I am in the camp of Team Trail Runner. I think that those are the best way to explore, get good grip in the trail, but also keep your feet very light. Um, I firmly believe that an ounce on your foot equates to pounds in your backpack, especially the longer the day and the longer the effort. So keeping your feet very light will make you feel better and able to log more miles in the end of this trip. However, this trail is very rocky. And so by the end of this trail, a lot of our feet were feeling very uh, tenderized to say it at the least. Um, they're getting sore. So if you are not logging a lot of tra uh, trail miles beforehand and building up some tolerances there, you may want to go with a trail runner that's a little bit more sturdy or a lightweight boot that's going to have a little bit of a stiffer sole. I don't, however, recommend that you get a boot with a ton of ankle protection unless you're carrying a very heavy backpack in which I would just say, go back a few minutes in this clip and get your pack lighter. And last but not least, invest in a backpack that can carry enough equipment for you to stay comfortable on this trip. What do I mean by that? Something with a sturdy frame with load lifters that's going to transfer that weight down to your hips, but you're not carrying five to 10 days worth of food and gear on your shoulders. Get a backpack that's going to transfer that um, weight down and also be a very light pack. Now, if you wanna see a new release from us here at Outdoor Vitals, we'll put a link down here below for our new CS40, which is on pre-sale, but the Shadowlight, which is currently available, is also a phenomenal option. Um, and the reason that I say that is these packs carry uh, heavier loads or longer resupplies like this exceptionally well, especially compared to most ultralight packs on the market. So get yourself a good backpack that will be able to handle uh, this longer stretch of trail without a resupply. All right, we need to talk about route planning and navigation. This is one that can be easier in some aspects because of new tools such as Onyx Backcountry's 3D uh, trail system where you can go in there and really take a look at everything. Uh, but when you are planning this, the most important thing that I think there is to plan is bailouts. 
Uh, if you have a storm come in and sweep you off the trail, or you develop high altitude sickness, or you twist your ankle, you need to know how you're gonna get out of there, and so do the people that are going to be supporting you on this trail. In most situations, you're looking at a 12 to 18 mile pack out. Uh, in order to get off of this trail, which is no joke. So you really need to know where those bailout points are and people need to know how to get there or if it's a possibility to get there. There's gonna be two options on the eastern half of the trail where you could get to a dirt road, but even on those dirt roads, you're talking about a two to three hour dirt road ride in a car to get out of there. So there's no easy bailout. So take this trail seriously and make sure you plan those exit strategies ahead of time. On a trail like this, a satellite communicator can be a lifesaver. Something like the Garmin InReach Mini is a go-to and has been super helpful for us as we've had to send people off the trail, not once, but twice. Uh, without those devices, it would have been incredibly hard to do this. So I highly recommend those. If you're looking to buy one, you can save some pretty dang big money by joining our Live Ultralight membership over on OutdoorVitals.com. So if you want to save some big money and you need to get a hold of one of those, go join that program. It's not going to cost you anything. It's just like a savings account uh, with us, but we're able to gate that pricing and get you a better pricing than is publicly available. All right, let's talk about a bonus tip, which may be the most important part of this entire video, and that is do not overestimate your abilities on this trail. It's rugged, it's high altitude, there's a ton of exposure out there, and it's easy to get ahead of yourself. So what I would advise for you is to take your current trip mileages. If you're averaging 15 miles a day, plan on doing about 80% of that on a trail like this, which would put you at about 12 miles per day and plan with that. Our team was able to do this in five days, but we are very well seasoned ultralight backpackers that train year round for opportunities like this. That's gonna be about as fast as you're gonna be able to make it through this trail, but for most people, take your usual mileage and times that by 0.8 or 80%, and that's what I would recommend uh, for you as you're planning out this trip. There you have it. By incorporating these tips into your Uinta Highline preparation, you'll be better equipped and better prepared for this adventure. Now we've made a ton of great content on this trail and a good place to start is a video which I'll link right up here. It's our most recent documentary. And down in the description below, we'll link other videos and podcasts that we've done. I hope that this has helped you. Make sure you're subscribed and we'll see you guys out on the trail.